Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. We know that all of you guys are super eager to see what AMD has in store for you with third gen Ryzen. And the good news is our review isn't too far away. In fact, in just a few days time, we will have a full performance breakdown for you. But before that, I just wanted to take the time and recap the Ryzen journey so far, and just have a look at how the ecosystem has evolved over the course of two years. So let's go back to first gen Ryzen, which launched in March of 2017, and shook up the desktop CPU landscape for the first time in a long time. On March 2nd, AMD unleashed their new Ryzen 7 lineup, which consisted of the Ryzen 7 1800X at $500, the Ryzen 7 1700X at $400, and the Ryzen 7 1700 at $330, all offering eight cores and 16 threads on the AM4 platform, with Intel's flagship consumer desktop part at the time being a measly quad-core Core i7-7700K, the fact AMD was providing double the cores was of course a pretty big deal. But before we got a look at performance, there were concerns and doubts about AMD's ability to deliver. As reviewers, we had just struggled through the terrible AMD FX era, where AMD often delivered high core count parts only to get smoked in basically every performance test. AMD were promising a huge 52% improvement to IPC with Zen compared to Excavator, but we were wondering how this would translate into real world performance. For productivity, these chips were champions. Across the workloads we tested, the chips were very impressive and beat the 7700K in key workloads like Adobe Premiere, and often Ryzen went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Intel's higher core count HEDT chips. While all processors were great value for productivity, the $330 Ryzen 7 1700 was basically a steal for these workloads given it could be overclocked up to the level of the 1800X in many cases. However, gaming performance was a bit of an issue at launch. AMD in their Ryzen presentation insisted on testing with a high-end GPU at a 4K resolution, which as we said in our review really isn't how you test a CPU for gaming. This meant AMD was essentially masking their performance issues in gaming, and when it came to actually testing the chips, we were left a bit disappointed even though we did expect Ryzen to struggle here a bit. In our initial coverage, the i7-7700K ended up around 21% faster at 1080p gaming than the Ryzen 7 1800X, and initially there was a lot of discussion around these results. I distinctly remember reviewers like Gamers Nexus copying a lot of hate over these performance numbers, given they were tepid on Ryzen's performance, I guess given it was still quite far behind Intel's performance in gaming. We thought that perhaps there was some sort of configuration issue initially, maybe some day one driver issues or motherboard teething problems stopping these chips from performing better. And in hindsight, it is kind of funny looking back over all the confusion at Ryzen's initial launch. As it turns out, the margin between Ryzen and Kaby Lake stayed relatively consistent across the months after its launch. It maybe improved a little bit from optimizations and so on, but the general consensus remained that the 7700K was a superior gaming processor. Interestingly, now two years later, it's kind of a different story, and Steve has a great video breaking down how the 1800X stacks up against the 7700K in modern titles. The key thing to note here is that while the 1800X didn't really improve much in older games, newer titles began to utilize Ryzen more effectively, and started utilizing more than 4 cores and 8 threads, which means in a lot of demanding games, the 1800X is actually now faster than the 7700K. So there's certainly been an interesting, if gradual, change to how these CPUs have fared for gaming titles. Tasks. Part of the reason games are using more than 4 cores can be attributed to Intel's response to Ryzen. Later in 2017, the company launched the Core i7-8700K and other Coffee Lake chips, which increased the top core count to 6 cores and delivered better performance again. In productivity tasks, first gen Ryzen 7 still competes strongly with the 8700K given it has 8 cores compared to 6, but the gap did close up, and for any workloads that were single threaded or heavily used AVX, the 7700K did beat Ryzen. And then for gaming, the 8700K handily beat the 7700K and managed to extend its lead over Ryzen, which led us to call it the new gaming king. Meanwhile, or actually a little before Intel's new Coffee Lake chips, AMD did launch what would become the best of the Ryzen lineup, Ryzen 5, and in particular, the $220 Ryzen 5 1600. For this low price, AMD was offering a CPU that often beat or came very close to beating the Core i7-7700K in productivity workloads. And while it suffered from the same gaming drawbacks as the Ryzen 7 CPUs, it wasn't that much slower in games at the time and definitely held its own against Intel's similarly priced Core i5s. 
Again, Intel return serve with the Core i5-8400, a locked 6-core, six 6-thread six part, which defeated the Ryzen 5 1600 in gaming for a lower price, while falling a bit behind in productivity. While this part was a good deal at the time, it was almost impossible to buy one at the MSRP for months, which hurt its value proposition. This allowed AMD to jump on board with some price cuts and keep the 1600 firmly in front of mainstream gamers buying decisions. Personally, I jumped on board as a Ryzen 7 1700 early adopter within the first month of its release, and it was a fairly rocky start. There were issues like unstable software, particularly BIOS updates for motherboards as vendors worked through some of the problems with the initial launch. Memory support was always a bit dodgy and could vary a bit depending on the CPU and motherboard you got. Certainly Intel CPUs were compatible with much higher memory speeds. In fact, motherboard quality in general for the first few iterations wasn't amazing as I think many OEMs decided not to focus a lot of resources on AMD platforms given Intel was still what people were buying. It's pretty crazy to see how far we've come going from X370 to X570. All the big vendors this time around have top-notch boards with beefy VRM designs because enthusiasts are now buying plenty of AMD chips and plenty of AMD boards to go with it. Anyway, aside from my early issues with Ryzen, the performance I was achieving for the price was phenomenal, and the 1700 was the perfect combination of productivity performance and gaming performance for my needs. It was just as fast at video encoding as expensive Intel HEDT offerings, and for me, as a 3440x1440 gamer, not 1080p where CPU limits are a bigger issue, Ryzen's lower gaming performance compared to Intel was a bit of a non-issue. In April of 2018, AMD launched second gen Ryzen based on Zen Plus and built on 12 nanometer technology. Rather than staggering the launch, AMD pushed out Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 5 CPUs in a simplified lineup on the same date, with lower prices. The Ryzen 7 2700X at $330, the Ryzen 7 2700 at $300, the Ryzen 5 2600X at $230, and the Ryzen 5 2600 at $200. As for performance, 2nd gen Ryzen largely delivered three things. A small but serviceable increase to CPU clock speeds, improved latency for small improvements to gaming performance, and support for higher frequency memory. The story didn't change a whole lot thanks to these improvements. The areas where Ryzen was strong, like productivity performance got a bit stronger, and Ryzen was able to offer better value than Intel in this segment. While with gaming, a 7% improvement looking at the 2700X versus the 1800X meant that it still fell behind the 7700K and 8700K on average. Of course, later in 2018, Intel did respond again with the Core i9-9900K, bringing 8 cores and 16 threads to their mainstream desktop platform for the first time. With Intel now having core parity with AMD, Intel's ability to clock their CPUs at up to 5GHz compared to the low 4GHz range for Ryzen meant that the 9900K was faster than the 2700X across the board. But like with 1st gen Ryzen, 2nd gen Ryzen continued to deliver in one key area, and that was value. While the 9900K was priced at over $500 at launch, and continues to be around $500 to this day, AMD was able to offer decent performance for several hundred dollars less. Particularly in the back half of 2018, the Ryzen 7 2700 was often available for just $250, making it a really competitive option in terms of value. Better than that were, once again, the Ryzen 5 CPUs. In fact, for much of 2018, with Intel CPUs facing shortages, especially for the popular Core i5-8400, second-gen Ryzen 5 CPUs were by far the best option for mid-range and entry-level gaming PC builds. While the Ryzen 5 2600 launched at $200, it was available for $170 as early as July 2018, and flash sales dropped that to an insane $150 on a regular basis. And of course, while all of this was happening, we had Threadripper and APUs occupying the top and bottom ends of the market, often delivering highly competitive performance at great prices as well. But I guess if I talked about all those products as well, including the 2950X, which I personally use for video editing, uh, we'd be here for quite a lot longer. So in reflection over the last few years, I think Ryzen has been largely quite impressive. AMD has gone from being thoroughly uncompetitive in CPUs to offering products that are actually worth buying. For a good year and a half, until Intel responded with the Core i9-9900K, AMD held the performance productivity crown for mainstream desktop processors in most workloads and delivered excellent value across the board, especially with Ryzen 5. 
We've also come a long way with some of the issues Ryzen had. Almost all the early adopter issues are non-existent today. Memory support is fine and second gen Ryzen can support high frequency memory. There are no stability issues. And I think we've all come to accept the position that AMD holds in gaming as fine for many use cases. While Ryzen does still lose at 1080p gaming with a high-end GPU, for those playing at 1440p or with mid-range GPUs, even Ryzen 5 CPUs deliver a great experience at a fantastic price in modern titles. Motherboard quality is also improved and it looks like we're getting the best generation yet with the upcoming X570. On top of that, many people have figured out ways to tweak memory performance with older Ryzen products to squeeze out the last few drops. And finally, the promise of AM4 upgradability seems to be a definite reality with older boards continuing to support third gen Ryzen processors today. But for all the good things Ryzen has brought, there are still some areas AMD has to improve in. The Core i9-9900K is the fastest mainstream desktop chip on the market for both productivity workloads and gaming. AMD has loved to offer strong productivity performance, and I think this is one area they'll be looking to reclaim the crown with third gen Ryzen and higher core count parts down the line. AMD has also suffered a bit in AVX workloads, but again AMD are promising architectural improvements with 3rd gen Ryzen to tackle this. The big question of course will be gaming performance. Will 3rd gen Ryzen's architectural changes allow these CPUs to produce gaming performance that matches productivity performance? Will AMD beat Intel CPUs in gaming or come close to beating it? How these chips fare here I think will be a huge talking point given the historic weaknesses of Ryzen in this area. The other area of interest to me will be value, especially given how cheap 2nd gen Ryzen processors are these days. While launch prices between 3rd gen and 2nd gen are very similar, I'm curious as to whether the performance gains will match the price increase relative to today's low prices. And over the next few months, how available will these CPUs be, and will they receive discounts like 2nd gen, especially for hot products like Ryzen 5? So, very interesting times ahead. Don't forget to subscribe to catch our Ryzen 3000 series review in the next few days. It's the one you've been waiting for. Consider supporting us on Patreon. We really appreciate the support of everyone who contributes to us directly through there. And I'll catch you in the next one.